So, so, so in my talk, I would like to um, talk about two different ways how, how one can identify whether a system is topologically ordered and also extract more further information about the type, the properties of topological order. Um, so basically, this will go under the, the, the joint topic of, of finding order parameters for topologically ordered phases, which is, of course, something which is challenging because, as, as you all know, I guess there's no local order parameters for systems with topological order. Um, so, so I'll try to cover two works. Um, one is um, very new work um, with uh, Ruben and with Ashwin. Um, so this is still in preparation, and if there's still time at the end, I was initially optimistic, but after I actually had prepared the slides on the first part, I noticed that it takes pr pr presumably more time than I expected, but if there's time, I would like to also cover some other very different way, but somehow motivated from the same initial ideas, way to construct order parameters um, using tensor networks, which is joint work with Mosin Iqbal um, from like two years ago or so. Right, um, so I'll, I'll keep the motivation short. I will not introduce tensor networks. I assume everyone here knows what tensor networks are. Um, so the talk will be about topologically ordered systems. And um, as I guess all of you have heard and or know very well, um, topologically ordered systems are systems which have very unconventional type of order, which, is, which cannot be detected by local order parameters. And that's a starting point, right? How can we detect this order, either in experimental settings or in numerical simulations, if there's no simple local ways of probing these properties of these systems? And this manif manifests itself, for instance, in some topological degeneracy of the ground space of the system. Um, so the degeneracy will depend on global properties of the surface on which you put your system, which is incompatible with local order parameters, because if you have local order parameters, the possible values they can take will tell you how many ground states you have. And in particular, there are these exotic excitations which come in pairs, which you can only create pairwise, which could have fermionic, but also more exotic statistics when, when you move them around each other. And throughout the talk, as an example, I will, I will uh, consider the Tori code model um, because it's pretty simple, right? Um, and it will illustrate most of the essential ideas. Many of the things I'm saying can be generalized to more general settings. And the Tori code model has these two types of terms. So there's this X term, oops. Wait, uh, where's the laser pointer? This is a button, okay. Um, still have to get used to the remote, All right? So, so there's an X term which is acting on plaquettes here, around plaquettes, and there's a Z term which is acting around vertices. And what the Z term does, it enforces that all configurations in the systems are closed loops. So whenever I put a red loop, that's a one state. So the ground space consists of closed loops on this lattice. The spins are sitting on the edges. And the X term ensures that I get all loops with the same weight. So the ground state is a superposition of loop patterns. Um, and now what we're interested in, of course, if we actually have a Tori code model and we're sure we have it, there's not so much to probe, but we will take this as a starting point. But what I really would like to, to, to study, to talk about, is what if we don't have a Tori code, but we move away from the Tori code, we perturb it. When I say perturbation, this doesn't mean it has to be small. I'm just saying we, we add a term, right, which, which moves us away from this nice Tori code fixed point model. And this will change the physics quite a lot, right? The system, for instance, will... Um, the, the operations which create pairs of anions will not be nice string operators. They will become somewhat more complicated. Um, and eventually, at some point, there will be a phase transition where topological order breaks down. And we might also be interested in understanding the nature of this phase transition, right? So what, what is a critical exponent, the universality class, and so on. And that's a question I would like to talk about. How can we detect if a system, once we are not at the fixed point, has topological order? And are there ways to use such fingerprints, which tell us something about topological order? Fingerprint, you can think of order parameter, right? Can we use them to extract additional information? For instance, critical exponents, critical behavior. Right. Um, so if we look at the Tori code model, um, one characteristic feature we have is that to create excitations, we have to act with a string-like operator here, right? So we have this operator, which yeah, that doesn't work well. Which, which, which acts as with a string of x's. And what will this do? It will flip the spins along this edge. So if you look what we had, we had some configuration. We flip it, we get a new configuration, which is illustrated on the right side. And this configuration has some defects indicated by these green dotted circles, where the lines are not closed. Right? Either I have a line which ends, or I have three lines meeting, which is not a closed loop constraint. So these are the anionic excitations which we can create in the system. And now this can be used as one way of saying the system has some topological properties. We can look at these string operators and compute their expectation value in the Tori code ground state. So that's an operator creating a pair of topological excitations. And you can quite easily see that if you put such an X string operator, the overlap with the original state will be zero, right? Because your ground state only has closed loops. Now you have open loops somewhere. 
So that's an orthogonal state, but also from a more conceptual perspective, you're creating a pair of topological of anionic excitations. There's excitations which are topologically distinct from the ground state. This should be orthogonal to the original ground state. And you can do this with both types of excitations, with X excitations and with Z excitations, um, which are the dual excitations, which in the dual picture would break loops on the dual lattice. Now, an important point to note, and it's maybe not so clear from this, maybe it is, but it will become more clear later, hopefully, that this is a boundary effect in the sense that if I look at these strings, it's an effect which doesn't come from the bulk of the string that this expectation value is zero, but it comes from the fact that there's something happening at the endpoint. That's something you can see on the right. In the bulk of the string, you have the closed loop constraint, right? It's not that it's orthogonal because of the bulk, it's orthogonal because of the boundary. So the wave function is only affected at the end of the string. On the other hand, if I would put a closed loop of X or Z operators, these will have expectation value one, even on the torus, around the torus, if I pick the right ground state. So it's, it's not a bulk effect that this is zero, it's really a boundary effect of these strings. And the point is that the endpoints, right, the boundary creates these topological excitations. Now let's, let's see what the same type of quantities do if we're in the trivial phase. So now let's take the limit where we put the Z field, for instance, to infinity in this Hamiltonian with an X and a Z field. Right, so we're looking at this Hamiltonian up here. Um, we take the field to infinity, so we have an all zero state. Now if we apply an X operator, the expectation value is still zero because the zero is flipped to a one, but let's not look at that one. Let's look at the Z string. This, there, the, the zero state is an eigenstate, right? So we have expectation value one, independent of the length of the string. That's a very different behavior from the topological phase. And now whatever happens to these expectation values is a bulk effect, right? We have a product state. So each term in the product contributes in the same way. The boundary is no special. Indeed, we could kind of twiggle around with the boundary and this thing might not be one, but it would still be non-zero, right? So the behavior is really something now which is dictated by the bulk and not by the boundary, but it's the same operator. The reason why in one case the behavior is dictated by the boundary and in one case by the bulk is because in one case the phase is topological and the other one is trivial. So that's the kind of effect we would like to distinguish and that certainly works for these nice fixed point wave functions. Right? So if we look at the Z operator in this case, this will allow us to distinguish whether we're in a topological phase or in a trivial phase. Now, that's not very useful as of now because of course we have the fixed point. Um, so we don't really distinguish phases, right? It was a lie, we're distinguishing the fixed points this way. I haven't at all said anything why this should work away from the fixed point, but that's exactly the goal of this talk, to show how such ideas to construct order parameters by applying the string operator, which creates a pair of anions, can be used to probe topological order beyond the fixed point, when we move away from the fixed point. And what I would like to do is to present two different routes. One is to generalize these operators as operators acting on the physical system, this whole discussion will in some sense not require tensor networks to say how these operators work, right? But in order to prove that they work, I will use tensor networks. So tensor networks will be a proof tool, but these are operators which can be measured in experiment, right? So if Michel Lukin prepares some uh, allegedly topologically ordered system in his experiments, he might want to know, is it really topologically ordered? Or other people might want to know it. And um, then he might ask Ruben and Ashwin and um, um, yeah. So, so, so that's one kind of uh, set, setting where this could be applicable, right? So it's really something which can be physically measured. Nevertheless, tensor networks are important because they form a tool to prove, to understand how, how, how these order parameters work, why they're stable. And the second, the second generalization, if we get there, is a generalization which uses a virtual PEPS degrees of freedom. And this really makes it an inherently um, PEPS construction, right? It's something you can use in numerical simulations, but you can't measure things on the virtual level, right? Um, it's, it's just a description of a state, right? It's not a state. Um, so that's something one could use in simulations to, to extract information. So there are really two very different constructions, but both use PEPS, but also in very different ways. Right, so let's start with the physical order parameters for topological order. Um, so let's, let's reconsider again um, what, what I talk, what I said, right? I looked at the trivial fixed point and the topological fixed point, and I said in one case a string operator is zero, and in the other case it's one. But it was only one string operator which had this behavior. And I claim there's a difference between boundary behavior in the, trivial in the topological phase and a bulk effect in the trivial phase. So let's reconsider the trivial phase um, and now, what we, so what we did is we said we put a pure Z field, right? We had a zero state, then one string operator had expectation value zero, the other one had expectation value one. So now let's um, look at the case where we put a diagonal field, right? So a field which is diagonal in the XZ direction with some ratio gamma here, 
what will happen then? Well, our state will be diagonal, right? So it will be the state theta here, which is somehow diagonal in the xz plane, which means that if we compute the expectation value of either of these operators, the state will not be an eigenstate, right? So we will get some expectation value lambda, which we then get to the power of L. So both of these terms will decay exponentially with some exponent. But again, in both cases, it's a bulk effect, right? It's, it's not an effect coming from the boundary. Every spin um, um, contributes equally, which is exactly why we have this exponentially decaying behavior. Now, again, another way to see it's a bulk effect is that we get the same effect for closed loops, right? It doesn't matter if the loop is open or closed. Um, now, of course, measuring the thing for a large L is not practical. It will decay exponentially to zero. Um, so it also, it's not clear what we're looking for. So what we would like to do to see um, to, to see the, the, the pure boundary effect, or actually what we want to see is that there is no boundary effect here, we should divide out the bulk effect, right? So what we should do is we should measure this expectation value of a string operator, but then subsequently divide it by the expectation value which we get from, from the periodic boundary condition case. So when I write tensor L, that's a finite string. Tensor N is supposed to be a string going around the torus. You could think of other closed loops if you think a torus is not very experimentally feasible, although Ruben yesterday told us that you can do tori in experiment. Um, then you could do a closed loop, but then the, like, a, like this, right? But then the, the proof will not work so nicely, so let's look at, look at a loop around the torus. So if we want to really see what is going on in the system, we should mod out this, this boundary effect, uh, this bulk effect, to see if, if the boundary effect forces it to be zero. And in this case, if we divide this out, we always get the same lambda, so we get expectation value one. So what we're looking at is the expectation value of a finite string with ends, divided by a closed string without ends, normalized per unit length. This mods out the bulk effects, and this means that there is no boundary obstruction. So this is one in the case of, uh, of the trivial phase. Now let's look again at the topological phase. Um, so, uh, can you back to the previous slide for a second? Sorry? Can you go back to the previous slide for a second? Sure. So the thing you normalize by is a big loop that goes around the whole system, or just any closed loop? I'm, I'm sorry, can you stop moving so much or go to the last row if you want to work? I mean, that's it's super distracting. You're like a meter in front of me, and you keep moving the whole time. So, sorry, so what's the question? Yeah, the question was, uh, so the thing you normalize by is that a big loop that goes around the whole system? Okay, for the, just for the, for the argument and the proof, it's a big loop which goes around the torus periodically, because otherwise the proof would be, I have no idea how we would do it. Um, but I guess from a more practical point of view, you might think of closed loops if you don't have periodic boundaries which you measure like that. But then, of course, you have corners, so it's getting tricky, right? If you, if you don't want to deal with tricky issues, just go around the, um, around the torus. So that's the idea, right? So, so n is a linear dimension of the system. And then, of course, you have to divide it per unit length, right? You really want to, to, to cancel out this effect here, the lambda. Can I ask, I mean, um, is there a lattice gauge theory sort of a... a way of talking about this, where you have dynamic matter or you don't have dynamic matter? I guess, yes. Right, um, because the, the, this is sort of a known like embarrassment, like when you have like Wilson, nice Wilson, once you put dynamic matter, they, the loop, the, the strings now start meandering. Mm -hmm. and kind of just have we, we'll end up at something which is very resemblant of something known indeed from the gauge theory context, which is okay, yeah, Marco order parameters, which are constructed exactly. basically okay, this fine. way. I'm, I'm hesitant to claim it's the same, also I'm not an expert how it's constructed in the, in the gauge theory context, but I mean, we're not, we, we don't have a gauge theory here, right? We have something which in some way can be mapped to gauge theories, but it's not the same, so one has to be careful saying it's the same, but of course there's lots of analogies, right? So it's very analogous indeed what we're doing in the end to, to this Friedenhagen Marco. In what sense is, is this not a gauge theory? Sort of a Tori code, I thought, was this a V2 gauge theory? At least some of the Tori, I can't Yeah, well, there's some mappings to gauge theories, right? I mean, there's, there's no gauge symmetry, right? There's, there's no, no symmetry which, you, which is enforced by the, the physical law. No. <laughs> but it's a bit of a matter of taste. Some people would claim it is. I... That's maybe more reasonable, yes. Although, but the matter is not explicitly there, right? OK. <laughs> I mean, if it comes on these, you can make an explicit gauge theory. I'm supposed to, to, to use your one. microphone. Otherwise, the poor people on Zoom will be a. Uh... Um, just a quick comment. Yeah, so I agree that if you add an extra kind of qubit to make explicitly make account for presence of matter, the model is really easy to let as gauge theory. And then it's really the Friedenhagen Marco string order parameter. Yeah, okay. And so our goal was to kind of see whether there's a rigorous reason to think that order parameter should work or register perturbation theory argument. 
Yeah. Uh, one more question. I, I mean, I suppose this only works for translation invariant states. So could you maybe yeah. generalize? I don't I think mean, so, no. I mean, I mean okay, let's, let, 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 uh, maybe we should discuss this after I explain how we prove it, and then we see if I use translation invariance in the proof. I was going to suggest... I, I, don't, I don't think I do, models. but of course, in some sense, there will be some uniformity condition entering somewhere. I think that's, that's clear. But uh, I mean, for now, this is still the RG fixed point, right? It's not that I moved away, actually moved away from the RG fixed point. I just took a different RG fixed point. But I, what I wanted to, to say is that, that this is equal to 1 is actually a bit misleading. Um, by the way, in second nice effect, now both, both things are equal to 1, right? Before, one string was 0, 1 was 1. So it was just because I looked at a very, very special case. That's a more, more kind of general case. So, so this, this already points out that we should indeed take this quotient, this ratio, right, of close to open loops, maybe. And now we can ask the same in the topological phase, what happens when we move away from the fixed point? And then what will happen? Well, what we know is that if we change some parameters mu in our Hamiltonian, the ground state would change a bit. And this can be approximated very well by a low-depth quantum circuit, right? That's basically using a tool called quasi-adiabatic continuation and then like discretizing, trotterizing. It's approximate, but it's a very good approximation. And what will happen is that this quasi-local uh, evolution will start to widen these strings up, right? They will also get more complicated. They will get pretty complicated operators because they're evolved by some low-depth quantum circuit. And this complicated string Sx still creates a perfect pair of anions. But of course, we can't measure this complicated string, in particular because maybe we don't know in experiment what the exact perturbation is. We just know that maybe we're not at a fixed point. So we could try to use the original string, and that's the goal, and the hope might be that this works if the string is close enough to the fixed point such that this um, dressed operator Sx is still very close to the string operator. I'm not sure that's convincing. That's why we'll give a proof later. We can say it's not convincing, then you will have to hold your breath under the proof. Um, but of course, even if this approximately equal works, it still means approximately equal per unit length somehow, which means also in this case, you will incur a penalty which goes with a unit length, right? Um, because it will wash things out per, per unit volume with, with some specific weight. So also in this case, we should try to, to cancel out this effect to see the pure boundary effect, because otherwise, if we take the X string operator instead of the dressed fattened string operator, then this will anyway go to zero if you make the string long, just because of some bulk inaccuracy in this approximately equal. So we should take this quotient again, and now the hope would be, that's why I put a question mark on the equality sign, right, um, that these things should still be zero if we're in the topological phase, at least if we don't perturb too much, um, because there should still be a boundary effect, right? The hope is that this X tensor L string creates something which might not, not be really what we want, but at the end point, it still has this topological contribution. Okay, so this leads us to this definition of the order parameter, which is indeed, as was already uh, said, very resemblant uh, to the Friedenhagen macro order parameter. I guess uh, it depends how, how, how you look at these mappings. Mm. So the idea is that one takes a, a string operator creating a pair of anions on some finite length, right, up to L, and divides it by the expectation value per unit length for, given by the string operator with closed boundaries wrapping around the torus. And for instance, the toric code, one could take x and z, or one could also take x, y, and z, for instance, right? I mean, actually, one should take y in principle. Um, in more general models, one should take the full set of possible string operators. Um, and yeah, so one would replace the sigmas by the corresponding string operators, which create anions, or which, in the closed case, map you from one ground state sector to the other one which you get by kind of moving one anion around the torus. In the general case, you would like to actually dress the endpoints of these strings, because otherwise, but that's the same for all kind of order parameters, right? They can always vanish for fine-tuning reasons, so you would like to put some, some random endpoint at the, at, on the whole thing. And then, of course, one might want to argue, one could argue how big does this endpoint have to be relative to correlation length, such that you get a notable signal or not, but uh, that's something to take into account in Ruben. There's nothing better than your co-authors asking <laughs> questions in your talk. No, no, actually, just <laughs> even more annoying. I just want to make a quick comment. Actually, no, just for completeness, because we discussed the Friedrich Hagen Marco order parameter similarity, I just wanted to point out that there, um, there's also the work by uh, Gregor Hughes, Mosner, and Sondi, oh, yeah. who mm -hmm. literally study this object in the Toric code mm -hmm. the field. Um, so the order parameter has appeared as such. The goal here is to, again, kind of show that it, like, or analytically try to show that it works or not. Uh, mm -hmm. Right, yeah. 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 I, uh, I just prepared the talk last day, so there's, there's no references to the relevant literature. I was indeed hoping to probe Ruben yesterday, but uh, he showed up just in time for his talk, so there was no time. Good.
Right, so, so, so what do we know about this order parameter up to now? We know that it's zero at a fixed point in the topological phase, and it's one at a fixed point in the trivial phase. We don't know what it does above, uh, in between, but of course the hope is that we can show that it's stable zero in some neighborhood of the topological phase, and that it's stable one in some neighborhood of the trivial phase. And that's what I'm trying to, going to discuss. In particular, I will discuss the stability in the topological phase in the neighborhood of the fixed point. Right, so how, how do we go about showing it's stable in the topological phase? Well, we will use tensor networks. It's a tensor network workshop. So we will do this using tensor networks. And the key point here is that if I use a tensor network to describe topological phases, such as a Tori code, the tensors, which we need to use to describe the system, will have an entanglement symmetry. This is very well established by now. If you write them down exactly, they have a symmetry in the entanglement degrees of freedom. If you simulate them numerically, you can afterwards show that such a symmetry shows up, or you can enforce such a symmetry without changing the state. And the symmetry is of this type, so it's, it's a symmetry where we multiply all the virtual degrees of freedom with some symmetry operation. Um, in a way that it cancels out, right, if we put things together, or alternatively, so, so this, for instance, would be like a Z operation, which could be a Pauli Z, but for higher bond dimension, it would really be a Pauli Z times some identity matrix, right? So there's a plus one and a minus one block. And one can rephrase this equation by putting the Zs on the other side of the equation, and then it tells us that if you have a string of Z operations, we can pull it through a tensor, and that's exactly what, what links it to topological order, because then we can put such, such strings of Zs along, say, the torus in a loop, and this will give the different ground states, and because these strings can be freely moved because of the symmetry, they're not anywhere specific, right? So there's no local way to tell the ground states apart, yet it turns out they're different ground states. And we can use it to, to model anionic excitations. So for instance, putting a string of these, the string will have two endpoints. These two endpoints form excitations, and again, the string can be moved, so really only the endpoints are something which can be detected. Um, then there's this dual excitation, which is a single X, because a single X anti-commutes with a Z string, so you loop a Z anion around the X anion, you get a minus sign, which is what you know you expect from the Tori code. So there's two types of objects which create the excitations. It's strings of these symmetries, and it's like things which anti-commute with the symmetries, if you wish, order parameters for, for that symmetry. Right, so, so to give an example, if we look at the Tori code, where this comes from, so the Tori code consists of the superposition of closed loop patterns. If I want to make a tensor network for the Tori code, I can slightly decorate my lattice by introducing these horizontal and vertical edges. That's really the same kind of loop pattern on a slightly decorated lattice. The decoration doesn't actually have spins, right? The spins are still where they are, were initially, namely the diagonal edges. And then I take this gray block and take this as a unit cell, and my tensor just encodes all possible string patterns going through that unit cell. So this means if the virtual, oops. This means if, 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 for instance, I have a one on this virtual index, it means a string is entering there, and then the string can go on the bottom, or the string could go on the top. So there's two possible configurations, physical configurations for this boundary. And since every string which enters has to leave somewhere, there is indeed a Z2 symmetry, right? The, the, the number of strings which enter must be 0 mod 2. So if I multiply it with Pauli Z, I'm in the plus 1 sector. Um, right. So we will use this to study what happens when we apply a string operator of physical X strings or of physical Z strings, because that's the order parameter we defined, right? We take a physical Z or X string and look at its effect, especially at the boundary. So let's take these tensors and ask what happens when we apply a physical X on the two physical degrees of freedom. Well, I should have updated the picture on the right, I guess. Um, if I apply an X, it means w there was a loop here before. Now the loop is gone. So the picture on the right is kind of not correct. The loop is gone. So there shouldn't be a loop leaving either. So I should apply an X there as well, right? Because the X exactly means I flip the, the state which says there's a loop going through these horizontal indices to there's no loop going. So these two axes can be pushed to the virtual level. If I put a z, this gives me a minus one for each line. So if a line enters here and leaves at the bottom, it means that I get a minus sign. If it continues, I get two minus signs. They cancel. So it means I will get a z on this leg here. So in both cases, I can push a physical string to the virtual level, which means I get the following if I have a long Z string, the Z string will get pushed through to a Z string here, right? Because I get a Z for every tensor. If I do the same for an X string, something different will happen because I get XX 
at every tensor. So I get two axes here. The axes cancel in the bulk. And the pair of anions consists of two axes, which is really what I said in the slide before what the excitations are, right? Strings of these and axes. So this indeed did create the excitations I claimed on the slide before were the excitations. Good. So um, what I will do in the following is I'll focus the analysis on the Z on, on the X string. So a string operator which only creates axes at its endpoints on the virtual system. The Z analysis works in a similar way. It's a bit more, more, more tricky, so that's why I picked the X. Also, by duality, you know, actually, if you can make it work for the X string, you go to a dual representation, it will work for the Z string. So, um, right. Um, so, so, so now if we go onto a torus, which, well, we think of as something sliced up into the cylindrical slices, and we have this Z2 symmetry in each tensor, this symmetry will be inherited by a whole column, right? Because if I apply the symmetry, it will cancel out along the column and it will only act on the left and right indices, which I can write as this commutation relation, saying I have a set of tensors, I apply all these to the left, I can move it to the right. Or I will use this more compact notation. Let's use this pointing stick here. I can use this more compact notation uh, where I define this to be a tensor C for column, and there's this uh, calligraphic Mathcal Z, which is a Z acting on the whole column, and then I have an MPS for the whole column with this commutation relation, right? So the C is block diagonal. The second thing we can do is to insert flux strings, which would give another sector of ground states, right? Putting a, a string of Zs. Again, the string can be moved, so it doesn't have a fixed location. And now in this picture, if we cut our torus into slices, like on a cylinder, the natural basis to work in is to say that on the one hand, there's flux strings. And on the other hand, I can project onto the even or odd sector of the C2 symmetry, right? So it's like one plus a string and one minus a string. That's a more natural basis, right? Because it commutes. So I have a nice basis in which my transfer matrix becomes diagonal. So again, I will only focus on the charge label, which means the plus one or minus one sector of the C2 symmetry. And for now, I will ignore the C string. I could claim I do this because of duality, but that's a lie because I already broke duality by saying I will look at X strings. I do it because it's complicated and we will not need it, but I, I will show in the end what happens with a Z string. Good. So now what we can do is, well, we, we want to look at the expectation value, so we should look at transfer matrices. So let's look at the transfer matrix for one column. So on the top right, there's what, how we define C, right? It's a single column. And Z was a Z symmetry it had. And if we define the transfer matrix, well, in, on the level of the transfer matrix, we will have this commutation relation on the cat level and separately on the bra level, right? So our transfer matrix has two symmetries, one on the cat and one on the bra level. It will commute with the Z2 symmetry. So it means it also has this joint symmetry, right? If I combine the two, of course, it's only two independent symmetries. Now, the point is the first line in the symmetries, the single layer symmetry is actually broken. Uh, it turns out. Um, I will not discuss why, but it basically relates to the fact that different ground states in the topological phase are orthogonal, and that's exactly measured by, by the symmetry. If, if there would be a symmetry, they would be equal. They're not equal, so the symmetry is broken. So the only symmetry which actually remains is this joint cat bra symmetry. This is actually not broken. So the two separate ones are broken, but they're broken in, the, in opposite ways, right? So the joint symmetry is preserved. That's pretty cool. So if we have a symmetry and a matrix, and we know the eigenvalues of the transfer matrix are important, well, what will we do? We will use this double layer symmetry, which has eigenvalues plus and minus one, to label the eigenvalues of T. Say the leading eigenvalues in each sector, and it turns, so there's an even or odd sector. It doesn't really matter. What matters is there are two different sectors with different labels. It turns out the even one is a leading one, but that's not relevant. So we have an eigenvalue one because we normalize our state and the other eigenvalue in the other sector is zero because again, it amounts to overlap of different ground states. So um, now we can use this picture of eigenvalues of the transfer matrix labeled by sectors to analyze what happens to our string order parameters, uh, Friedenhagen Markov type order parameters. And there's two strategies. Let me first present strategy one. Spoiler, it will not be the one we should pursue. It feels very natural though. So what we, what we do is we, we, we compute this expectation value on a very long cylinder, right? We let n go to infinity and later l, and we put the string of x operators. And then we use this relation on the top right that we can take this string and push it through to the virtual level. And again, we will make use of the fact that there's different eigenvalues in the different symmetry sectors. 
So let's push that string of x's through. Now our x's are sitting here and there at the endpoint of the string. And now we can look, well, we have the same transfer matrix everywhere, right? So we take the spectrum of the same transfer matrix everywhere. Um, and now what happens? Well, this thing is, is taken to infinity first. So we are certainly in the red sector, right? Because that's a dominant eigenvalue. Um, and now what happens when we go to this slice? Well, there's an x. The x anti-commutes with a z. So it will change that sector, right? So we change to the other sector, which gives zero, and then we change back. So indeed, the expectation value in the denominator, uh, no, numerator, I always get confused for some reason. In German, it's nana, which starts with n as a denominator. It's ultra confusing. Uh, right, so the thing on the top <laughs> in the fraction is zero. And just to be safe, the normalization is, of course, the normalization of this thing here is, of course, given by putting this thing on the torus where the x's will cancel and we get the dominant eigenvalue, right? That's kind of the point. We're dividing something which is zero by something which is one, and this gives zero. So it sounds like a great idea. Maybe we can use this to perturb our tensors and then prove that it holds away from the fixed point. However, this doesn't work because exactly this equality I used to go from here to here, that I can push that string through, will not hold away from the fixed point, right? This x operator is nothing special anymore at, uh, away from the fixed point. It gets kind of fattened and smeared out and everything. So it does not have a nice virtual representation anymore. So we will need a different strategy. And that's the same picture as on the slide before, just written in a transfer matrix formulation, right? So I have my transfer matrix on a, I have my tensor on a, on a column. I have the normal transfer matrix, then I have the transfer matrix with my x strings in between, just a string of x's, and then the normal one again, and I want to study the same quantity. And well, what will I do now? Well, I look at this transfer matrix with a string of x's, and as we said before, this amounts to putting a single x on the left and on the right on the cylinder. And now I, let, let me look again at the spectrum of the transfer matrix. Well, the normal transfer matrix had this spectrum, one sector, the other sector. So if I look at this side of the equation, I have to apply this x, which will flip the symmetry labels, right? So the transfer matrix with an x in between will have swapped symmetry labels on its eigenvalues. Now let's do the same. So we have the normal transfer matrix, the one with the x string in between, and again the normal one. And now, well, what do we have to do? Well, the normalization comes, well, the, the leading eigenvector is here. And this will have overlap only with the same symmetry sector, the red one. So again, we get 0, whereas the normalization is given by the leading one. So we divide 0 by something non-zero, by 1, and we get 0. So you would say that's exactly the same as I did before. It looks like the same picture. The only thing is that instead of saying there's an x which swaps sectors, I swap the sectors in the transfer matrix. Yet it makes a huge difference because this strategy is stable against perturbing, changing the column tensor. So why is that? Well, let's imagine we smoothly change our column tensor because we changed our Hamiltonian. And let's assume it's smooth. I will discuss this on the next slide, why it should be smooth. And it's a smooth change which preserves the Z2 symmetry, which indeed if we evolve our system with like a quasi-adiabatic evolution, we only apply a finite depth circuit on the physical system. So the symmetries on the virtual system should indeed not be changed. So if we have this effect, what will happen? Well, we have the transfer matrix. The, the spectrum of the transfer matrix, if we change C smoothly, right? C contracted with C bar. If C changes smoothly, the transfer matrix changes smoothly. So its spectrum changes smoothly. So the spectrum will change somehow smoothly at some point. I mean, it's normalized because we normalize a state, say. At some point, maybe the leading and subleading, the, 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 the two eigenvalues in the different sectors change their ordering, but it will take a while. The same for the one dressed with x, right? They will change, but it will take a finite amount if that change is smooth until they actually cross. Which indeed means that if we look at this order parameter, right, which we can re-express as just the trace of the transfer matrix with and without x, what we will have is that we have this dominant sector which stays dominant for a while, so it means the, the, the numerator is given by this lambda e eigenvalue, whereas the denominator is given by the normalization, which is a green sector, the odd sector, which is larger, right? So what we have is that we're dividing lambda e by lambda o to the power l, right? So as long as, as, as we're in this regime where they don't cross, this will go to zero. And um, this will work for a finite radius if the change in the c is smooth in a good way. I will, say, I will say in a moment what a good way means. So indeed, it means that this, the, the fact that this order parameter is zero at the 
RG fixed points in the topological phase, is a property which is stable in a finite region around that point, assuming some nice uh, change. Now here comes the subtlety. Um, if, if, if you write down these bounds, you say something changes smoothly, there, there's, there's, there, okay, there's two issues. If, if C changes smoothly, there's still the issue that the change in the eigenvalues will depend on the size of the matrix in some way. And well, this is a transfer matrix of a 2D system, right? So its size grows exponentially in the circumference. Also, if you change each local tensor in the 2D pep smoothly, the whole column will change faster and faster as n goes bigger. So we're actually not in this scenario where this C changes smoothly. This is a valid proof in 1D, but we're in 2D and we blocked, right? And these columns are getting bigger and bigger. Um, so this really will only work if the bond dimension of the C is finite and it changes smoothly in the change of my Hamiltonian, right? So, so how can we get this to work for PEPs? And it turns out actually it's, it's, it's surprisingly, um, oops. It's uh, surprisingly nice if you indu indeed again use the fact that if you change your Hamiltonian, this amounts to applying as, lo as long as you're gapped a finite depth quantum circuit. Because if you have a finite depth quantum circuit, this will only affect your state. Well, it aff will affect your state everywhere, obviously, a finite depth quantum circuit. But it has a finite light cone, right? So as soon as you compute expectation values, um, the, the finite depth circuit will cancel out, except on the strip where you apply this operator whose expectation value you want to compute, right? So, so what this means is that in the end, in the expectation value, you only have to keep your finite depth circuit for a strip of a finite width. And the second thing is, so we have an, ex but, but it's still a 2D expectation value, right? This doesn't make it 1D. It's just that the, the circuit has a finite width, or the circuit you keep, the cone. Um, on the other hand, the state we're applying this to is a toric code. It's an RG fixed point. And the tensor network for the RG fixed point can be very nicely contracted. So the whole second dimension collapses to something of a fixed bond dimension, exactly because it's an RG fixed point. And I don't have a picture for that. It's probably very complicated to illustrate it. But in the expectation value, the second dimension collapses to something of a fixed dimension, right? So the only thing which increases your bond dimension is the strip on which you have your effective light cone of your low depth circuit. So in the end, the whole thing collapses. The whole second dimension collapses to something of a finite bond dimension. So you are left with something where the change induced by your Hamiltonian only enters at a finite power corresponding to the width and the bond dimension is finite, so the argument from the last slide does indeed imply, uh, apply and things change nicely and smoothly. Right, so, so what we find is indeed that the order parameter in the topological phase is stable around the RG fixed point, so there's a finite regime in which, uh, in which this will still be zero. Question. Yes? Um, uh, so I'm not an expert, but I was always under the impression that finite depth means up to logarithmic corrections. Well, it, it depends how big the tail is, right? Uh, yes, which, but which sort of if, you, if it actually grows logarithmically, then your bond dimension would grow polynomially? Or what? Yes. But that's still fine? Probably not. Well, well it, it, it depends. One has to look. But, but in, in principle, of course, um, I mean, I mean the, the, the faster your, your, your column matrix changes in the Hamiltonian parameters, mm -hmm. the faster the gap might close, right? Yeah. And the bond dimension will also enter in these bounds. So you don't want these to grow if you, if you want to take the system size to infinity, right? Because if they grow, this will kind of mm -hmm. shrink this too much. I mean, I mean, there's this epsilon with a finite depth, which indeed is not a rigorous epsilon. I mean, I think, yeah. I think we have to be very clear by, uh, about this, right? This is not a proof because cutting these tails rigorously is an incredible pain. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I hope I didn't make the impression that cutting these tails was fully rigorous. It wasn't my intention. But I mean, once you assume that, that you can go to a finite depth quantum circuit instead, then, then everything else is fully rigorous. And you know, if you want, you can put bounds on how, uh, when this can close earliest. We, we didn't do that explicitly, but it can certainly be done, right? It's just some continuity inequalities. We might work it out when we write it up. Right, so what about the trivial phase? It turns out, I will, I will not discuss this, but one can show that something quite similar works in the trivial phase. One can show that if one applies a finite depth circuit to a product state, like the RG fixed point in the trivial phase, um, the string order parameters um, will always be non-zero if I allow for a suitable endpoint. And the intuition is somehow if you have a string order parameter, which is zero, not because of the poor choice of the endpoint, but because of some topological obstruction, it creates a domain wall. 
which really means you must have long range order in the state you apply it to, right? And we start from a product state with a finite up circuit, there is no long range order. So that's the reasoning. And of course, suitable endpoint really just means that any random endpoint will do. Also, of course, it could be that very small endpoints only create a very small signal. That's always possible, right? If you have a very large correlation length, you might have to choose an endpoint on that order to get a noticeable signal. That's indeed something, of course, one has to be careful with. One divides two numbers, right? And um, if you actually measure this experimentally and uh, the, the, the denominator has like a, is, is very small, then your error bar might actually make it very unclear if this thing is zero or non-zero. But um, I will show in a moment that it's actually much better than one might be be concerned with. I mean, one thing you can definitely see is that uh, the denominator close, I mean, for the denominator, the same argument will hold close to the fixed point, right? The, the spectrum changes very, very slowly for all things. So you know, and you know you divide by one at the RG fixed point in the topological phase. So you will divide by something which decays very slowly if you're close enough to the Tori code, right? So it's not that this is completely out of control. There are clearly cases because you divide two numbers where you get a very big error bar. But it's, it won't happen close to the Tori code, right? Because everything changes smoothly. So if you're close enough experimentally and you want to make sure you are, you will divide one number which is strictly zero and one number which is pretty big. So it's, it's not a general concern, but it's something to keep in mind indeed. Um, so in a, in a real experiment, you would also have decoherence. So your state wouldn't be entirely pure. So could you put in another axis here with a purity? And do you know how it would look like? Mm. I mean, my, my, my feeling would be that once you get thermal, you always get a doping with, uh, with, with, with anions in some sen uh, sense, right? Like charges or so, and this will typically break the topological order. So then it would become immediately one or zero point? Probably not, no. I mean, everything is smooth. I think you can yeah. use the same argument that things behave smoothly. Mm. Um, I, mean, I mean, one tricky point about this order parameter is, of course, it's, it, it's supposed to be exactly zero. So if it's just very small, um, I think one thing which would probably happen is that suddenly you, 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 you get a non-zero contribution from the endpoints because they're not topologically distinct from the grounds, well, not ground state, but thermal state, but almost topologically distinct, right? I mean, what this is measuring the topological phase is that there's an orthogonality constraint coming from the endpoints. If you're not strictly orthogonal, you will get a very small signal. I mean, the eigenvalues of the, of, of the transfer matrix will not give you small signals all of a sudden or so, but uh, I think the endpoints could. My, my suspicion would be if you go thermal, you would probably get a small signal from the endpoint because say your endpoint is a charge, right? But your thermal state has a low doping with charges. So if you have a charge at that state, you're not orthogonal to the original state anymore because you have a fluctuating charge there. So, so my feeling would be it would get non-zero, but really from the end, uh, as an endpoint effect. So you also needed the Z2 symmetry for the argument. So is the idea that any physical perturbation that you would add would preserve the Z2 symmetry? Well, I, okay, um, maybe it was, I should have added a picture. Um, so if, if you have an, a, an MPS, PEPS, whatever, with a symmetry on the entanglement system, and then you add a finite depth quantum circuit, which we do, right? This is like adding an MPO layer. This will not change the symmetry because you don't even touch these legs, right? It, it stays all the way it is. It's just that you apply an extra layer, you increase the bond dimension through the circuit, but you keep the original symmetry, tensor it with an identity on the rest. But the sector labeling stays the same. I mean, I mean the, if you want to do it cleanly, you shouldn't change your bond dimension, so you really want to rewrite this circuit as something which does the identity initially, and then you change it, but it always keeps the bond dimension fixed. That's probably a cleaner way to do it, because otherwise, indeed, this continuity argument for operators which even change their, their dimension wouldn't work. Um, yeah. What? Yes, uh, I think we're basically done. So this can be used to verify the presence of topological order, modular error bars, and thermal states. Um, and I would like to show some, some numerical results. Um, so we looked at the toric code in, in, in the magnetic field. That's, that's the last slide then. I won't get to the second part of the talk, but I expected that. Um, Good, so we look at the toric code with a magnetic field. We, we, we do an optimization where we impose a Z2 symmetry because that allows us to access the symmetry labels and ask, how, wh wh I mean, basically we look exactly at the spectra which I plotted of the transfer matrix and see what happens. So, so um, that's the phase diagram of this model. I apologize if I stole this picture from someone in the audience. Um, so we look at this green line, right, which is some diagonal field of X and Z. And um, so that's a spectrum of the transfer matrix. So it's the largest eigenvalue in each sector. Red is even and green is odd as before. After the phase transition, that symmetry label breaks down. So there's actually only one symmetry charge symmetry sector, charge condenses in this transition. So that's why the lines are gray. And there's, there's a different flux sectors, which you can forget for now, but uh, they're also important in principle. So we see that um, we have, 
So, so, so we see what, what happens is that for, for, for the, so that's actually the phase transition of the model. So there's no crossing in this transfer matrix up to the phase transition, right? I said the gap with the, the sectors will stay in that same ordering for a while. They stay so actually until the phase transition. This is a transfer matrix for the X operator. You see the same happens. The gap actually only closes, um, so, so, so there's this green, okay, one thing you see is here we have the red sector leading and the green sub leading. Here it's swapped, which indeed we said, right? Then these eigenvalues change, and again, only at the phase transition this breaks down, which indeed means this order parameter will be zero all the way to the phase transition. On the other hand, after the phase transition, you have this square sector, which is a flux-free sector. There's no other symmetry label. And now the leading sector here is a flux-free sector, and the leading sector here is a flux-free sector. So they, it, it's the same sector, right? So you will get a non-zero value, which is indeed consistent with what we said, that one can prove it's non-zero. And if you compute this order parameter, that's how it looks like. Um, so it uh, gives a significant signal right away. Now we can also do Z strings. I didn't talk about them, but the same argument should hold. For the Z strings, actually the red sector is leading here and here, right? So the charge label does not distinguish them. However, as I said, there's a second label, right? And the label which distinguishes them now is the flux label, right? So there's a different leading flux sector on the left, which is the square and, and the diamond superimposed. And with a z-string, you have a different sector label. So again, you're orthogonal. Now, not the color label, but the flux label, the shape label. And again, after the phase transition, so only at the phase tra transition this closes, and now suddenly, actually, you shouldn't look at this sector. You should look at this one, because that's the, the matching sector with this one. And um, that's the other parameter. The reason why it's noisy is really that we figure, I mean, it's, the data is not optimized for this purpose but we're really filtering a signal which comes from a super small eigenvalue of the transfer matrix, right? It's not what a variational simulation will optimize for. That's a completely irrelevant effect in some sense. One notable thing is actually also that um, you see this number here, sorry, this number here is by what you have to normalize, right? That's the decay of the string per unit length um, in the topological and then in the trivial phase, and you say, see this stays super close to one. You can indeed know what the asymptotic value is because then all spins are aligned in a somewhat diagonal direction, and that should be 0 0.85 or so. On the other hand, for the, this is a string which condenses. For the Z string, that's a decay with a distance. This is super small, right? You will not be able to measure this reliably experimentally, presumably, because you're dividing to extremely small numbers even for small l, right? It's this number to the power of the distance. I mean, it's, it's, it's two sides per l, but anyway, half the distance. Um, so that's a confined anion, but it's maybe not so surprising. If you want to see that it doesn't do much to the ground state, better pick the string, which, if you know what, what, what's going on in your system, which corresponds to the condensed anion. Okay, that's it. Let me stop here. Okay, thanks, Norbert. Do we have any more questions? Just like one or two? Okay, one in the back. Does the order parameters that you were discussing, does it work for any perturbation, or is it particular to the... No, no, we, we, made, we, made, we made no assumption on the perturbation. That was exactly the point, right? It, it's hard to illustrate numerically for all perturbations. It's, uh, I mean, that's data I had from the second part of the talk, which I didn't get to, right? So um, that's why we look at these slides. Okay, last question, Matt. Uh, so for a, a PEPS practitioner, does this lead to sort of a new algorithm or so, some sort of new way of studying, you know, if I'm studying a topological state. Like well, in if, IDMRG, if, they studied entanglement spectra. So would this be like, you know, this is how we should be doing it if we're doing PEPs? No, I, I think if you do numerical simulations, you should do what I, what I was planning for the second part of the talk before I finally prepared the first and notice there's no time for the second. No, no, I, I mean, this is not very efficient in that case. I think it's much more efficient to, to, to I mean, the other option is to say, push things through the, to the virtual level immediately like at, at the RG fixed point, and then measure that thing at the virtual level even, even away from the fixed point. Um, this gives you also access to more quantities. It's something which is not physical, right? You can't measure strings on the virtual level, um, but it's a second generalization, right? This is, we said, let's leave the string operator on the physical level as we move away from the RG fixed point. It's very physical. The other option is push it to the virtual level at the RG fixed point where you can do it and keep that object at the virtual level and then look at that. I think that's what I would do for numerical simulations. You get, you get more information. And I mean, as you saw, the second order parameter was not very nice because it was really something you filtered out of the noise of the whole construction, so to say. And this will not happen in the other case.